Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre. Nausea is a philosophical novel that was written in 1938 by French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. It explores the mental life of the troubled young writer Antoine Requentin, who is a man at the age of 30 who spends his time writing a history book about a person called Marquise de Rollibon, an 18th century diplomat and traveller. Throughout the novel, we see Requentin becoming more and more disgusted and more and more aware about the nature of his own existence. He gains unnerving and profound insights into some existential and metaphysical truths that he was previously blinded to. In this presentation, we'll begin by trying to understand what Requentin means by nausea and what effect this has on his experience of existence and also of meaning in the world. So although Sartre never defines explicitly what the nausea is, we can look at his descriptions of it to gain a better idea of this peculiar and profound experience that Roquentin is having. He states early on that there is something new, for example, about my hands, a sort of nausea of the hands. His perception is beginning to change, but he can't quite put his finger on it straight away. He goes on, the nausea isn't inside me. I can feel it over there on the wall, on the braces, everywhere around me. It is one with the cafe. It is I who am inside it. So this is not just a subjective and passing feeling, but it is affecting everything around him. It's not just a feeling originating from inside of him, but it is rather he who is enveloped inside of it. He states that nothing looked real. I felt surrounded by cardboard scenery, which could suddenly be removed. Everything is beginning to lose its solidity and its familiarity. Everything that he used to feel so familiar around has taken an alien quality upon itself. He writes that nothing has changed and yet everything is different. So he's definitely not hallucinating a new reality, but it is rather that the current reality is being seen in a completely new way. His hand is still there. He's not hallucinating that his hand has turned into some weird branch of a tree but it's just his hand has adopted a peculiar quality to it. It's similar to how if we were dropped off in some new alien environment with strange trees and fruits and animals and so on, we would look at every detail of it because it would be so foreign to us. And for a quantan, it is this reality that is becoming foreign and alien to him. A further effect is that objects, objects begin to lose their purpose and importance and all the labels that we ascribe to them no longer actually attach to the objects. Rather than seeing stuff with the conceptual categories and the idea of the object's function and associations that we draw with the object, Roquantan is beginning to see stuff for the pure existence that it is, without any of the labels attaching to the object uh, like they previously did. He writes, But the words remain on my lips. It refuses to settle on the thing. Furthermore, he states that things have broken free from their names. It seems ridiculous to call them seats or say anything at all about them. I am in the midst of things which cannot be given names. He realises that everything is full, existence everywhere, dense and heavy and sweet. All the labels we assign to things are just secondary and what is most fundamental to reality is just pure, overwhelming existence. We'll come on to this idea of existence being fundamental in more depth later. So everything has begun to lose its solidity, its meaning and its importance. In other words, everything is becoming superfluous. And this idea of superfluidity is very important and we'll explore it in more depth shortly. So even though Roquentin was so familiar with it all before, he can no longer make sense of it and it has all become very alien to him mainly due to the dissolution of conceptual categories that leave behind the pure, dense and overwhelming existence of reality. And this leads Roquentin to a fairly bleak conclusion that there is absolutely no reason for living. If all the meaning and purpose we have in our lives is purely arbitrary and is created out of our own whims, then it has no significance in the larger picture. So we are left with no reason for living or pursuing anything great in our lives. So now we can look at existence in more depth. So one of the primary sources of Anton's nausea 
is his gripping awareness that existence precedes essence. This is the idea that everything exists first and then is defined afterwards. So as humans, we are not born with an inherent human nature or essence that defines who we are, but instead we are born, we exist first, and then as we go about in the world, we define ourselves and create who we want to be. Anton becomes aware that the same applies to objects. Objects just exist and have no inherent qualities or functions to them, but it is we as humans who assign words and labels, characteristics and functions to these objects when in reality, all of this is just a construction. The essences we ascribe to objects are just comforting facades that distract us from the overwhelming nakedness of existence. Words are the means by which we can feel like we have some superiority over the world. We define it and categorize it and so on. But once the words begin to fail in this function, Anton is left vulnerable and exposed. The only thing that exists is existence itself. Anton feels like all the objects around me were made of the same material as I. He is pure existence and so is everything around him. It is just existence feeling itself existing. He writes, I was the root of the chestnut tree, or rather, I was all consciousness of its existence, still detached from it since I was conscious of it, and yet lost in it, nothing but it. Further emphasising the idea that existence is something so pure and so fundamental to reality that it is inescapable. It is everywhere and it is overwhelming him. Everywhere he looks, it seizes him. This experience is something very profound, almost like Anton has woken up from a dream and is seeing reality now for what it really is. He exclaims, and suddenly, all at once, the veil is torn away. I have understood, I have seen. He explains that existence is not something which allows itself to be thought of from a distance. It has to invade you suddenly, pounce upon you, weigh heavily on your heart like a huge motionless animal, or else there is nothing left at all. So this isn't an intellectual and conceptual comprehension of reality that he is having. Instead, it is a direct and profound personal experience. It is not something that can be grasped by the mind, but can only be experienced directly. But the world around him is not the only thing that is losing its identity and familiarity, as he himself is also losing the feeling of himself. He says, Now when I say I, it seems hollow to me. I can no longer manage to feel myself. I am so forgotten. The only real thing left of me is some existence, which can feel itself existing. He is emphasising here how our own identity, our own self, is purely just a collection of ideas and concepts and labels that we have adopted from others and from society. So when we become aware that these labels and ideas and stories we tell ourselves about who we are, when we realise that they are just complete fabrications and are not part of true fundamental reality, the feeling of ourself begins to dissolve. Anton is beginning to have this experience and his ego is starting to unravel and all that is left and all that can ever be left is just pure existence. Existence experiencing itself existing. This experience of ego death is linked strongly to ideas of enlightenment as well, where one sees that the self or the ego is just an illusion, a construction, and once the ego is seen for the illusion that it is, then one can become conscious of true reality. Anton also has some important insights into the nature of meaning and its role in our lives. Roquentin derives all his purpose in life by writing about Monsieur de Rollebon, who is an 18th century diplomat and traveller, but he becomes anxious that he must not make public the fact that Monsieur de Rollebon now, now represents the only justification for his existence. And could the same not also be said for us? Don't we also create some arbitrary role for ourselves in order to justify our own existence? Do we not create our own stories and tell ourselves and others them in order to make us feel like we are important and our existence means something? 
if we see these stories and the roles that we play as the fabrications that they are, then we are left with the bleak emptiness and meaninglessness of reality. He writes that Monsieur de Rollibon was my partner. He needed me in order to be, and I needed him in order to not feel my being. So writing about this historical figure allows Antoine to forget temporarily about the nausea and his own contingency. He states, I no longer existed in myself, but in him. It was for him that I ate, for him I breathed. I was only a means of making him live. So as we stated earlier, words had disappeared and with them the meaning of things. Everything has become superfluous. Everything is just part of a meaningless flow of events. He becomes conscious to the fact that he too was superfluous. He is completely unnecessary in the world. His life and his thoughts and his emotions have no meaning and all his hopes and dreams and his whole identity is just a creation. All there really is, is just existence, existing. If he was not there, existence would still be existing. There would be no difference. The world is completely indifferent to whether or not he is there within it. His bleak descriptions of thinking about his suicide elucidates this idea. I dreamt vaguely of killing myself to destroy at least one of these superfluous existences, but my death itself would have been superfluous. Superfluous, my corpse, my blood on these pebbles, between these plants, in the depths of this charming park, and the decomposed flesh would have been superfluous in the earth which would have received it, and my bones, finally cleaned, stripped, neat, and clean as teeth, would also have been superfluous. I was superfluous for all time. Suicide would do nothing to change it. So all that can be done is to spend your life trying to run from it, or one can embrace it and accept it as a fundamental and inescapable truth of reality. Thank you very much for watching and be sure to like if you found the video useful and subscribe for more videos. See you next time on Feeling Philosophical and goodbye.